say thanks for jumping on all together here. And um, I don't have any formal remarks to open up the press conference. I mean, to, that's not really a formal press conference here, but I think it was just good to be able to get everybody on. Um, so uh, I'll just open it up. If anybody, I mean, we're, first of all, I think the only thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, it's been a long process getting the uh, approval and the authorization to move forward with our games and competitions. And um, so we're happy about that, but we're obviously really busy right now trying to work with our schools and uh, getting everything going for this, uh, for, you know, games and competitions. So, um, but, you know, again, if anybody has any particular questions, I'm happy to answer anything that you have. And, um, and again, just glad that, uh, that we can get the winter season finally begun. Uh, Mike, just uh, curious, with how, how long is this, this winter season going to last? And uh, are, are we going to have playoffs at the end of it? Uh, yes. And so we've, so from our original calendar, we've extended the, um, the season for one week um, already for the regular season. And, and we're going to be having more conversations with our athletic directors association and our schools. Uh, and looking at our calendar moving forward for not only this season, but for the, for the rest of the school year. So um, one of the key components as we've been talking about is that we wanted to make sure that we could uh, get a clear understanding of when we were going to be able to start winter um, and then really starting to piece together the rest of the school year. Oh, hey, and Mike, the, other, the other question about the tournaments is yeah, yes. I mean, we're planning on having uh, winter tournaments and all the sports that, that we're offering. Mike, uh, Joe, get out of here. Uh, you touched it off off the top, but I guess just from from your group, how excited are you guys that you will give the opportunity to student athletes to participate in winter sports and what that means to you guys and, and all the schools that uh, compete in the Interscholastic League? Well, Joe, most importantly, I think that we're we're excited for our kids and and for the these athletes for this year. Um, to be able to to have this opportunity, and, and it's been obviously a long haul for all of us. Um, I want to give a, a, a huge credit to our our schools um, because they have to implement all of these safety protocols, and they've got to they've got to do the work um, to make the environment safe for kids. So for me, it's it's just uh, you know we we're just trying to do everything we can to support our schools to get these programs up and running to give these opportunities for kids. Because again, we're an extension of the classroom. Um, and, and for a lot of these kids, I mean, their connection to school goes through these sports programs. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why um, they're successful in their academics um, and, and for their own mental health. I mean, there's so many positives to kids being involved in school sports. Um, so we are, just you know, excited that that this opportunity is going to be there for them. And, and again, there's no um, there's no telling how this thing is going to go. And so we're we're just trying to put as many safety protocols as we can in place, and make the structured environment as safe as possible, um, so that they can have these opportunities. By getting this in when you are getting it in and, and keeping the season to a certain time. Uh, do you hope to still have that floating season with football that you mentioned as the, the third season? Uh, th th the timeline still add up for that to happen? Yeah, yeah. So, so our principals committee on athletics is our board of directors. And, and um, we've, we've stated all along that our intention is to offer every sport this year. Um, so, again, we've got some challenges ahead of us to do that. And, um, uh, but, you know, that's our intent. However, what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be taking a look at where we where we are as a starting point for this winter season of, of competition, uh, making this a meaningful season for those kids and then looking forward to the rest of the school year and trying to put a calendar together to try to accomplish that goal of getting every sport um, completed this year. Mike, uh, last week. Uh, last week, Connecticut made the decision not to have football in that middle season. And one of the, one of the, well, a couple of reasons they cited. One of them was that the National Federation has issued guidance that uh, the high risk sports prohibition would continue to the end of March, and they didn't want to overlap, so they felt like there wasn't enough time to fit it in. And the other issue that came up, according to the people in Connecticut, was that there's guidance from the National Federation that if you play spring football that you have to reduce the number of games that you play in the ensuing fall. 
Are you aware of any of that? And what kind of effects that going to have on the decisions you make? <clears throat> yeah, we, uh, yes, we are, Keith. We're aware of, of, of all of those things. I, I, I think in, in Connecticut, um, it wasn't the National Federation that said that the high-risk sports would not be able to um, go uh, through March. Uh, it, was the, it was the Connecticut Department of Health, from what I, from what I believe uh, is the case. And so, so again, from the risk assessment levels, the Federation set those um, uh, risk level assessments. And what each state is doing is that they're, they're taking a look at each sport individually. Uh, and in our state, um, our Department of Health has decided to use the, the NFHS risk assessment levels um, as, as the guide that they're gonna use. So at, at this point right now, high risk sports in our state are, are not allowed. Um, so, so those, uh, so that's basically where we are as far as the risk assessments are concerned. Um, but again, those conversations are going to start to begin now that we've got some clearance to go with, um, with the winter season. Mike, is there a, a we're, I talked to a couple people today and they're telling me there's not going to be any fans for, uh, for basketball track. Um, I wasn't sure if that was true. Well, I'm pretty sure that it's true, but if you can confirm that, and then uh, any other fan restrictions for the other sports. So, so our our principals committee, uh, based on the feedback that we got from our schools, we surveyed the schools, um, and so the the policy that that we adopted, um, based on the feedback from our schools, was for any on campus gymnasiums, which would which would really be for basketball, um, because those are the those are the facilities that the schools control, and they're they're all different sizes. And they're all subject to all the restrictions uh, for social distancing and uh, and everything else that's put in place from the Department of Health to make to make the environment safe. So, based on the feedback, um, our principals committee uh, made a, a a policy that said that there are no spectators on on campus gymnasiums, and for all non um, uh, non on campus gymnasiums. So, basically, any off campus ice rinks and and different things. Um, we're going to leave it up to those facilities and the schools to make the call on whether or not they, they can allow spectators. So in, in, in indoor track, um, the city of Providence has already made the decision that there will be no spectators because it's their facility. So, you know, I think it's going to be, uh, uh, the whole issue of spectators is that obviously we want those opportunities for people. Um, but each environment is a little bit different. So it's, it's a, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, but in, in order to get the games up and running, um, you know, this is the policy that we have in place for now. And we'll certainly monitor that as, as restrictions might loosen uh, or we get towards the end of the end of each season. If there are opportunities for us to um, to allow spectators, then we obviously will. Mike, do you mind if I add one thing on spectators at the PCTA? Yep. Um, the, at the PCTA, also one of the one of the huge factors for not allowing spectators is the fact that our kids, our athletes are going to be using literally the entire building to, in order to socially distance. So we're gonna have teams, um, you know, really on the floor, on the basketball courts um, with tarps. Uh, we're gonna have them up in the stands when they're not racing so that, so that everybody is observing social, observing um, the correct social distancing. So there really isn't that and the, um, uh, the overall number within the PCTA really don't allow for spectators. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, it is true that Providence is not allowing it, but at that particular facility for our, our track into a track meets, it's, um, it's much more complicated than just the Providence school system, because um, really we just don't have the, uh, the capacity there or the space to allow for spectators. And, and yes. just as a quick follow, does Burrowville hockey and Mount St. Charles hockey fall into that as, as on campus? No, that's why, that's why the, again, it's on-campus gymnasiums. Um, and, and so that's, that was the uh, spectator policy that we put into place. So again, I think unlike the fall, the, in the fall where everybody was outside and um, there, there were some different factors involved. So, you know, we had a little more of a cookie cutter approach as far as how the spectator issue went. Um, there's a whole different set of issues going inside that, that has to be dealt with. So, you know, again, we're putting the priority on trying to get these kids playing first. And, and then, um, you know, again, if, if there are opportunities out there for us to be able to loosen that, then we're certainly going to look at that. 
Hey, Mike, um, real quick. So we, you, earlier you mentioned the high-risk sports are a no-go right now. And uh, are you getting that high-risk list from the NFHS uh, recommendations? Is that where um, that list is coming from? And what exactly are the sports right now that you have down as a uh, high-risk? Well, in, in our state, the, the ones that, that we have are football, wrestling, and competitive cheer. And again, those are those are categorized by the NFHS as high risk sports. And and again, you know, guys, I, I understand the question about the high risk sports and, and different things, but I don't think that's really the, the the news of the day. I think the news of the day is that we've got we've gotten clearance to go ahead with our winter sports, and we really want to focus on 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 those kids right now. Um, and again, those those conversations are going to happen uh, very shortly, and and with the input of our schools. Um, and with the obviously with the input of the state officials and, and the Department of Health and all of those things. But, um, you know, I think the news of the day basically is that we're really happy um, that this clearance has been given for our kids. And, and now we're going to move forward with the rest of our, our goals. Hey, Mike, Matt Jolis with uh, SFBN Rhode Island. Um, how important is it from a social health perspective and a mental health perspective to the student athletes of these schools uh, that they're able to go ahead and play this winter season because we know just from talking to so many of these athletes and coaches how important being around their teammates and being able to play uh, in their sports and in their teams is to their development for their futures, whether they be athletes or just as members of our society. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I think that one of the things, and again, I want to really credit our schools, our superintendents, our, our principals, our coaches, our athletic directors have been doing an unbelievably great job of, of providing these opportunities. And I think that's why we do it. I mean, we do it in, in a normal year. Um, you know, we give these opportunities for kids because it's an extension of, of their, their educational um, experience. And so, so from a mental health standpoint, you know, kids have been cooped up in their house. Um, they, you know, they've been, they've been through pauses. They've been through, um, seasons that have been interrupted and quarantines and different things. And that affects kids in many, many different ways. Um, but I think it's the connection to, to school, um, that, that, that connection to school and just being involved in those, in those school activities that really uh, benefit them in the long run. So these experiences, as we've always said, are once in a lifetime. Um, once they're gone, you can't get them back. And so our focus has been on just, you know, being able to support our schools and providing these opportunities. Um, so again, there's challenges that we're gonna have to overcome, um, but we also know that the benefits um, outweigh um, a lot of the challenges. So, so the efforts that everyone's putting in right now um, are, 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 really, are really just positive thing for kids. And, and again, across the country, I mean, there are still six states out there in the country that have not yet played a high school sport this year. So. When you look at a stat like that, I mean, we feel very fortunate to be where we are. Um, and, uh, but, but we also understand that, that the, this, this virus has a mind of its own. Uh, it changes. Um, we hope that as things go on for the rest of this school year with the vaccinations coming out, that things are going to start to improve as we go. Um, unlike what happened in the fall where things were deteriorating. Um, but again, we don't, we don't know if that's going to happen. So, um, you know, just being able to get started right now uh, the schools will put things in place. Uh, kids will be out playing, and and let's hope we have a great season. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, Yanni Karak is here. Can you hear me? Hey, Yanni. How are you? Hey, doing well. Um, for boys and girls basketball, I, I forget if you mentioned this at the top. Will there be a statewide tournament as well as the division championships? So, so we're not planning for a statewide tournament this year. Uh, uh, I don't think time is going to permit that, but we are planning for divisional tournaments. Um, and, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of factors involved with the state tournament that, uh, you know, how do you qualify, how many teams uh, and different things. So, so we've, uh, we've made the decision that we're going to go ahead with divisional tournaments uh, this year. And, uh, but again, it's, you know, a lot of these decisions uh, about the end of the season um, are, are going to be made in the next few weeks, uh, but we're really trying to focus on the beginning right now. Hey, Mike. Hey, Tom. It's Brendan. Hey, Brendan. How are you guys? Um, Timeline-wise, you know, 
um, you guys sounded like you guys worked all weekend on this proposal. What did you as a league have to maybe do to, you know, alleviate the concerns of the Department of Health and DEM that, yes, we can do this? So, so first of all, you know, I want to, I want to credit and, and I, I want to really um, thank Janet Coit, the director of DEM, who's been, who's been part of, um, uh, you, you know, our liaison to the governor's office and, and, and the Department of Health. Uh, Sandra Powell from the Department of Health, who's been who's been very uh, good and, and a great advocate for us. Um, it, it really has been a collaboration of a lot of people. And for, for us to convey to them the modifications that we put in place, the safety measures that we put in place, um, take their feedback and then maybe go back to the drawing board and come back to them with more information on, on how we can provide a, a safe and structured environment. Um, there's a lot of give and take and a lot of meetings. Um, and, uh, you know, again, up until even last night, there were still some conversations that were happening. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I have to say that, uh, you know, all the work that, that we're putting in, we have a sports medicine advisory committee as a league. And uh, George Finn is the, uh, the athletic director of Barrington High School is our chairperson. He does an unbelievably great job with that committee of, of, of looking at all the um, risk assessments, looking at all the modifications, coming up with recommendations that we can bring back to the Department of Health and to the state um, to provide a safe envir environment for kids. So um, that's kind of how the process works. Um, you know, we don't have a direct line to the governor as far as, uh, you know, speaking directly to her, um, but we work in collaboration with all of these groups. And then, and then on top of that, we, we have to work with our superintendents and our principals and our athletic directors, and we gotta take their feedback and put all these things together. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge effort um, to put it all together. But again, I think it's a really worthwhile thing for us to be able to do and, and provide these opportunities for kids. And kind of asking about, uh, you know, the statewide basketball tournament from a swimming perspective, you know, we're starting the season with virtual meets. Do you anticipate maybe by the state meet, we might be able to have some kind of, you know, in-person competition or is that, you know, is that one of those things? Once again, we got to look one day at a time. Yeah. You know, I, I wish we could have a crystal ball and see that, Brendan. I hope that's the case. Um, but, you know, literally, literally, we are we are looking at this day by day. And I mean, we just got off a call with our with our schools. And now that we have the green light, you know, there's a lot of questions that the schools are asking of us. Um, you know, we need to work with our officials organizations on putting together um, you making sure that all these games can be covered. Um, so there's just a lot of a lot of things that need to be put in place in order for these these events to be successful. So you know, as as quick as these games are getting um, started, our eye our eye in our office is going to be put towards those those tournaments, and hopefully that we're going to be able to put together great experiences for kids to finish off um, the season um, at the end of the winter. Um, you mentioned officials. Where do they stand in all this? I know uh, we pushed the games back basketball wise Friday. I mean, traditionally, basketball referees, they go in, they change there, and then they have a chance to have a shower and then go out. Where do they stand and what their concerns? Uh, yeah, so all the guidance basically is, is the same for everybody. I mean, locker room use is going to be very limited. Um, and, and again, every environment, every gym is, is different in the state. Some are old, some are newer, some are big, some are small. Um, so they're going to be a little bit different uh, protocols in place for each one, but but for the most part, um, locker rooms are are, are not going to be available. So so we're encouraging our officials to come dressed um, to the games um, for the most part. Um, but in some cases, again, there could be games right after school. People might be coming from work, and and so we're going to be they'll be working with the school administrations on on places for them to change and and uh, and get ready for these games. Have you guys as a organization surveyed the schools and found out how many schools are going to be implementing COVID tests for their athletes? Uh, yeah, we have, we have done that. I mean, I don't, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but there's a, the majority, I can say the majority of the schools are, are, are doing some type of testing, um, which is a positive. I think that's, a, that's one of the things that, that, that we are very blessed in our state to have the ability to do, that there are tests available um, that they're that they're free, um, and that the test results are coming back fairly quickly. So, um, I think that's a key component 
for us moving forward, um, you know, to make sure these environments are as safe as we can make them. And so a lot of the schools have, have, been, uh, have been doing that. There's two different ways of, uh, for that to happen. There, there's in-school testing that can be done. And then there's also uh, the, many, the many sites across the state that the state has, has put together where people can, uh, can schedule tests and, and, uh, and get the results back really quickly. Mike, and I, I know you want to do things day by day, but if, if there is a, a pause again at some point this winter, is, is that going to be it for the season just because we, we still got two more to squeeze in? Um, well, I mean, again, every situation is different. So I think if that happens, we'll evaluate it. And, and again, how long is the pause going to be? Um, you know, what, you know, what, what, what do our schools want to support? I think that's a key component in everything that we're, that we do is that, um, you know, we take the input. So if, if, uh, you know, when, when a pause would happen, um, I, I hope that's not the case. I hope we don't have to deal with that. Um, but again, we'll make the best of the situation as the, as it develops. Right, and Matt Jones with SFP in Rhode Island again. So, uh, sorry, Eric, didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, what have you as the RIIL learned, given that we've been sort of in this for nine months now, uh, that, you know, seeing all things that affected the spring last year, the fall this year, now into the winter, what have you as the RIIL learned that it will help make decisions easier as we go should this continue into, obviously, this year's spring season and maybe potentially into the fall next year? Well, I mean, we've so we have the benefit of being connected to the rest of the country as well. So I think one of the things that that has really been unprecedented this year is that each state high school association um, has been connected and, and is networking. Um, you know, we we certainly in the Northeast we network every single week together, um, and then we also have calls um, nationally and we share ideas. So as things have have rolled out. Um, uh, the National Federation has a sports medicine advisory committee that, that uh, helps us, um, you know, put our modifications into place. Um, so all of those things have, have really helped us evolve as we've gone as we've gone on through the virus. Um, there are, you know, the safety protocols, the sanitization, uh, the social distancing. Um, you know, in the beginning of this, if you remember back in the in the, in the last uh, winter when we were closing things down and then trying to think about how we were going to do possibly spring sports last year, it was all new to us. And so everybody was starting from square one. Um, but as things have gone on, I think we've become a little more confident in what we're doing. Um, and, and, and the data is backing up that, that, that there's very, really little to no transmission happening during competition. I think that the areas that we really focus on are, are the, uh, you know, the bus rides, the, uh, the sidelines, um, the, uh, locker room areas like those kind of things that, that we, we've gotten very smart and, and very in, uh, confident about how we set up our our facilities and our in our in our, in our structure to make them as safe as possible so um, you know every every season we get a little bit stronger we get a little bit uh, more intelligent about what we're doing uh, but again we're tapping into a lot of national resources locally regionally you know we're just trying to do everything we can to to um, to um, uh, provide as safe an environment as we can Mike, along those lines, Mike, if I could jump in here, uh, JP Smallins, um, did you, Massachusetts is about three weeks into their indoor season. Do you kind of maybe seen what they've done and maybe sort of get an idea of what you could expect over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, we've, um, yeah, we've been in communication with them, um, again, almost weekly. And, um, you know, they've had, I mean, they've had some interruptions, but their, but their games are, are going on. Um, and, you know, I think our focus right now is about participation. I mean, it's trying to get kids back, back involved and make it as normal as possible. Um, but, you know, again, there, there probably will be issues that, that are going to pop up that we're going to need to deal with. Um, we're certainly hoping for a perfect season, but that's probably not likely. So I think that, that we've got we've to be tempered in our approach um, and just make sure that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, we, we resolve our issues and we learn as we go. Once the games start, I mean, there could be things that could pop up that could change, that could cause us to change some of our protocols. Um, and we're certainly going to be monitoring that and willing to make any changes necessary to, uh, to keep the season going. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, JP. Hi. Have you had any feedback from the athletic directors on whether they're going to require us to be tested before we show up at games at all? I know it's school by school, event by event. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good. I mean, that's a that's a very good question, Ron. Um, I, I I don't know specifically, um, but again, the regular season is in the hands of our of our schools. Um, so the guidance that we've given them, they've got to implement and they've got to they've got to figure it out um, in their own situation. So um, you know, our our what we're trying to say is to everybody is that I think the best way to handle this is that if you if you um, it, you know you really need to reach out to those school administrators. Um, because it could be different from school to school. There's school district policies that are going to be put into place. Um, you know, there's not going to be a cookie cutter approach to this. Um, every every situation could be a little bit different. So we just definitely want you to reach out and, and have those conversations uh, prior to even thinking about attending. And Mike, uh, kind of along those lines, with you know, with basketball and stuff, we contact the schools directly. But if we were going to attend something that was off campus or off site, you know, at hockey track, whatever it may be, who who would it be best for us to contact? Uh, yeah, I would say the first person would be the again the host school administrator uh, because they're going to know. For instance, if it's an ice rink, they're going to know what the policies are for that particular rink. So if there are stricter policies in place, um, you know they're going to be able to communicate that to you. So I think that you know I, I think in all cases it should be the host school administrator. And then kind of along the lines with hockey, um, are you guys going to kind of push these, these arenas to, to turn on their live barns? Because um, I know a lot of the schools have the NFHS for, uh, for basketball, but the arenas are, are different and offsite. Will you kind of be asking if they can use the live barns so, so parents can watch those? Yeah, we're, so we're encouraging all of our schools to, to, to stream um, as many events as they can and in whatever form that is, whether it's on the NFHS network, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, in some cases they're using YouTube, Facebook Live. I mean, there's all kinds of different strategies out there for each school to do. But I mean, from our point of view, we're just encouraging them um, to stream as many games as possible because it's a, it's a solution. If spectators are not allowed or limited, um, it's a way for people to be able to see see these games. And we certainly want those those opportunities uh, to happen. So, um, yeah, we are we are working with our schools. Um, you know, to, to find out what, what some of the challenges are and then seeing if that's something they can put together. So, uh, and again, the schools have done a tremendous job of, of trying to get out ahead of these things. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it all rolls out. Are there any other COVID changes or regulations that have been made since the last update you guys had? Um, no, um, no. So, I mean, basically the, the executive order that was in place I mean, the major changes on the on the, on this was that they're going to allow competitions in low moderate risk sports, and then uh, the other the other major change was that they're strongly in, uh, encouraging you know testing weekly. So those were the two major things that came out. Tom, is there any other ones that you could think of? Just the spectator policy, and then the spectator policy. That's right. A uh, question for both Mike and Tom, if you if you want to chime in, just what was your reaction when you got the green light? <laughs> Relief. <laughs> um, I don't think we can say those things on camera. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, look, I, I think, uh, you know, it's been a long process. And, and, you know, first of all, I think we, we were just as ecstatic when we got the ability to start practices, um, because I think the whole point is, Again, connecting, re-engaging kids in school activities. I think that's that's our goal. So it's it should be about participation right now. Um, you know, giving kids a positive thing to do, and, and even giving them a structured environment, which is almost like an extension to the school day. Giving them a, a more of an extension, uh, a structured environment, so that they don't put themselves in unstructured environments, if you know what I mean. So I think um, you know those are all positive things. I think that you know seeing kids out there performing is a, is is a, is a joy. Um, I think this is great for communities. I mean, we know how, how, how high school sports affect communities in a positive way. Um, so again, just getting a little bit of a glimpse of that. I mean, let, let's hope we can get back to normal at some time soon um, and really be able to get out and support these kids and, and watch them perform. And, and again, it's not about the elite athletes. I mean, there's, we certainly have our share of those kids, but there are a lot of kids out there that need, need these teams more than they need them. And so, so just being able to get this to this point is a real great accomplishment for, for everyone. Um, and let's just hope it goes really well. Tom, anything we don't have to everyone. Bleep out? Oh, no, go ahead. Just Tom, is there anything that we don't have to bleep out that you want to add on to that? 
No, we were we were just ecstatic. I mean, it was it was a long time coming and a big relief. Um, I'll echo uh, Mike's sentiments that Hi. Janet Janet Coit and uh, and Sandra Powell have been magnificent. Um, Carolyn and and especially Mike. Mike's just been you know he'll he'll never say it. He'll never take the the credit for it. But um, there are certainly times when you would not be able to publish what I'm saying. And Mike is always cool, calm, and collected. And uh, he's always got a little level head to him, and uh, he's definitely, definitely the right man for the job in this uh, in this uh, in this situation. So, um, yeah. having gone what he's going through is is just tremendous. So, I'd like to thank him for his leadership. I think, thank you, and I think that um, one of the things I want to really say is that the the you know we really need to provide our schools a little bit of support here um, in that. Um, they were really, I mean, up until last night, we still didn't know if we were going to get the green light. And now that we have it, um, our schools need, need, they need a little bit of time to, to um, get everything up and rolling. Um, so as, as anxious as everybody is to play, I just want to say that, that we, we really need to support our schools, our athletic directors, um, our administrators, our, our coaches, um, you know, just to, to give them the time that they need to, to get this thing off the ground. Uh, in Roland. So they, they are scrambling right now, I can tell you, and they're doing everything in their power to, um, to get these games going. Um, so just, you know, I just want to, I just want to throw that out there because I, I, I know how hard they're working and they're on the front lines. Believe me. I mean, as you know, Tom was an athletic director. I was an athletic director. Um, um, the, the amount of respect that I have for those, for those people is immense. Um, and when, what they do to provide these opportunities. So, um, you know, just for everybody out there, as fast as everybody wants to get these games going, just 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 a little bit of patience and support for them um, to get everything off the ground. Hey, guys, uh, really quick, I just wanted to go back to the live streaming question that Eric had had um, just to share with everyone that my company actually is the uh, Rhode Island affiliate for National Federation of High School Sports now. So we're going to be doing a lot of the games uh, for basketball and helping high schools out. Uh, you can go find us at our website, sfbnri.com. So that'll be, you know, if you need to find games or whatever, there's going to be a lot of them we're doing. We're working with five high schools on hockey right now, all D1. And then we just picked up some basketball uh, just actually just this morning because everyone kind of waits till the last minute. Um, so I just wanted to share that. If you ever have any questions or need help with anything or any of that stuff, you can reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to, uh, to assist or, you know, give you guys some information if you need it. Mike, are there are there dates as far as to when this se roughly when this season would end, and it, will it be overlapping with that third the fall two season? Tom, you want to take that one for now? I mean, again, this is not these, these are not definitive at this point. So, so we have not shortened the regular season. We obviously lost a week of competition from our original schedule. We were originally supposed to start last Friday, um, which was the 15th. So we did not want to shorten the, um, the regular season for the winter. So we have extended this regular season and then subsequently the playoffs. So we're keeping the same exact playoff format that we originally had planned going into a January 15th uh, start date. So we are going to push back um, one week, um, and uh, so it's going to you know the, the entire season um, is going to end on the twenty eighth, I believe Sunday the twenty eighth, uh, with the exception of um, hockey, which we'll just have the championships after that date. So it will be with you know within a week, but the championships for hockey will be within that next week. But then what does that mean for that fall two season with vol I mean, volleyball is the only thing that's cleared now, but if, if things would, cause I know they were, it was February 22nd, I think or 23rd. Is that now going to be pushed back to March one or is it going to have that overlap? We, yeah. yeah. They, I mean, Eric, it's just, it's just too early to, to really talk about that because our focus has been solely on trying to get this season up and running. And again, those are, those are going to be decisions that are going to be made um, through our schools and, um, and, and a lot of different factors that we're going to have uh, moving forward, but our, you know, our attention is going to turn to that very shortly. We, we, we got to, we got to start working on, on postseason tournaments and, and, and everything else. And we will, we will be working with athletic directors, principals, officials, 
coaches, everybody to make sure that the, the rest of the season goes as well as the, the first half has. Mike, really quick. Um, I haven't heard you say anything. I know we, I did hear a mention of it earlier, but uh, so, so teams are not required to get tested before games. Right. We're not requiring athlete testing. Or well, we the state, are. No, so, so the state guidance has come out. And so what they, what the state guidance says is that they're strongly advising that schools, um, well, schools and sports organizations uh, require weekly testing. Um, so that's the guidance that ended up coming out of the state. Um, I can tell you that the majority of our schools are already doing that. Um, so, you know, again, what we do from here with that is, um, is something that, that we could, that, that we're going to talk about, but that's the guidance as of today. Okay. 